That's how you know you did a great job. Where's the no, that's how you know you did a great job, my friend. It's always in the writing. I just have fun with it. I just act it out. It was a big oven-ready chicken. All the sheriff could think was, oh my gosh, how am I going to handle that? Suddenly he had an idea and rushed out of the office. He watched for a moment, then took a deep breath and yelled, g -g get down, chicken! D -d Don't make me come up there and get you! The judge and banker sat on the park bench, laughing at the little sheriff scolding the chicken the size of a house. Mr. Brown told the sheriff the chicken mysteriously appeared, exactly when the magical flatulent pumpkin blasted a big fart. Not like its usual squeaky little blasts. Then Mr. Brown performed a marvellous impression of the fart sound that created the big chicken. The pumpkin sounded like this, he said, putting his lips together and going, I had to come to the library. We had a little bit of a, a tiny bit of a crisis at home. Uh, oh, believe no. it or not, we're in a swarm of termites. What? Now, yes. now, whereabouts are you in the United States? Let's get some more info on this. <laughs> I'm in the, uh, I'm on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I am the in Pass Christian, Mississippi. Okay, so where is that near? Because I have driven mm -hmm. from New Orleans, sorry, from Memphis to New Orleans, down are, Highway 61, did I come down? Probably. We are 60 miles due east of New Orleans. Okay. Okay, so I've miles. been I've been close, been close. Right. Yeah, and it gets hot. We were there in August. It was stinking hot and, and <laughs> well, wet. Yeah. It's, it's been wet, and this is our first. We've not lived a year in this house, so uh, we messed around and left the light on in our pantry, and yeah. lo and behold, bugs in the house through cracks that we don't know that we don't know about. And you say termites, so they're not flying bugs, they're walking bugs. They're flying. These are flying termites. There are flying termites. Yes. They're flying termites. And I'm guessing they eat anything wooden or plastic even they would eat? It's only there steel and stone are probably safe, aren't they? Bricks? Uh, yep, yep. We, uh, I think these, based on our little Google research last night, these are the those that are looking to mate. They're not the ones that actually bore in too much to the house. But oh. uh, we've got the termite people coming out tomorrow morning. Okay. <laughs> now, so I'm guessing they're like ants. So you have a flying version that goes around and tries to build a new nest and a new whole new colony kind of business. So, yeah, I suppose that's one saving grace. They're not the ones that want to eat everything. <laughs> but they want to eat my house. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and our house is wood. We we live in a log cabin house. Right. A log yeah. cabin? Well, that's kind of romantic, isn't it? It is. It's romantic, and it is in a unique place. We're a walk to the beach. Nice. So, so you know, they're going to like our... Those bugs are going to like our house more than they like other people's home. What What's the old joke? The termite goes into the pub, and he says... Okay, where's the bartender? <laughs> yeah. That's a terrible joke. Yeah. I get it. I get it. So, so have you had to evacuate the house because it's preparing for fumigation or have the termites taken off the internet? What what what, what why why have the termites caused you to move to the library? Well, because believe it was only for a short period of time. The termites got inside the house, as in, yeah. in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the office. Yeah. They, I mean, you know, we left a light on, a light on in the pantry. And next thing we, we're watching TV, next thing we know, we see something flying in front of the TV. Then we realize, wait a minute, we've got a bug in the house. And my wife went around and looked, and they were in the house. So we get up in the morning, and they're all dead. Right. But they're, what do you got to do then? You got to get rid of them. They're on the kitchen counter. 
they're on the bathroom counter and they're on the floors. Right. So you can't just vacuum them up. You've got a, you've got a situation there. Yeah. There you go. You got to clean them all up as in sanitize and all of that. So I'm at the library, but I do have to tell you though, we are a little ways from a train track. So I just heard it. Um, don't know how that's going to impact us. I'll let you know if I hear it in the background. I'll just give you this, give you a sign or something. Oh yeah, just let me know. Yeah, we can. We can, I'm sure we can work around that. We can work around that. But I'm so glad you still decided to go ahead with this and the the true spirit of show business. The show must go on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, Greg. <laughs> okay. Well, we are recording now. Let's talk about this second book. Well, second audio book we've done together. You obviously have done lots of books. This is the second audio book I've worked on with you. The Magical Pumpkin Book 2. Now, the last one we did was book four in the series. So why are we doing them in a strange order? Well, that's because I'm a strange guy. <laughs> so, but, no, it, it's just serendipitous. Um, sort of how it happened. I had almost forgotten about my series. And last year, when my stepfather passed, I was walking along the lake in our neighborhood and a gust of wind came and it blew through the trees. And I, you know, that's when I remembered. And so time flies. It was so pointed for the moment. I said, you know what? That's where we're going to start. With We're Gone with the Wind. The first book was called Gone with the Wind. It was a kid's book. It was a lovely book. Thank um, you. Thank you. So you got some kind of si some cosmic sign that it's time to turn that one, number four, into an audio book. Wow. Uh, cosmic sign. There you go. <laughs> well, hey, I got more since then. You're right? going to die when I tell you this, even though we're yeah. talking about the case of the plucked chicken. Yeah, yeah. You know, my mother's name it was Mildred and my stepfather was Robert. And right. the people who we purchased this house from were Mildred and Robert. No. Wait, wait, wait. There's something else too. There's something else. There's something else. I was reading the, um, I was playing the book for my um, aunt and uncle and my cousins a couple weeks ago. And you get to this point where it says, Mrs. Fry's homemade cakes and pies. Yes. And you know, I wrote that book a long time ago. Yeah, it was Mrs. Fry who owned this house, and you can tell that she liked to bake. Oh, now it's getting a little bit uh, crazy, isn't it? I, I'm serious. When you say cosmic, I'm yeah, cosmic sign. There you go, boom. And I didn't know that we were purchasing the house from Robert and Mildred Fry until I saw the deed itself, and I said, "Look at that." And my wife almost cried. Wow. There's something else. <laughs> There's something else. Our first grandbaby vacation was right down here on the coast in a cabin by the beach that uh -huh. Teddy Roosevelt stayed in, right? Yeah. And my, our, our, our grandbaby was five years old. And we took her to places where the five-year-old would like to go. Now, this is a big place. It's not tiny. So here we are 15 miles away, and my wife... Um, chats up this lady while my granddaughter's doing something. It turns out that lady was actually at the house the day that we actually saw the house. And they remembered each other from that day. That was like four years ago. So, and all of these houses down here, and you think about that, all of all the places of all the time, of all the people, of all the places, how do they make that connection? And here we are. There's even more, but I won't go into it. Too much cosmic stuff will get to you, you know? Well, it's funny, you know, because um, I'm just coming up now on three years of doing audio books. Right. And... Um, I mentioned to a, uh, there's another author I work with in Florida, Daniel Pai, and she sent me an email about something, and I she, she no, I think she'd noticed on Twitter that I'd been to the eye hospital. I've had a problem with my yeah. eye, 
And so she basically said, well, how did you get the original injury? It was just, I was going for a checkup. She said, how did you get the in original in just injury? So I've just sent her an email explaining how I got the eye injury. And it reminded me of how I got into audiobooks because three years ago, just before lockdown, I was, as you know, I was a radio host. Right, right. And three years ago, I was the program director of a London radio station. And uh, I got fired like a few weeks before the lockdown. So when the lockdown hit, I couldn't get arrested. No radio stations were hiring. So I ended up, with, we were two years into two big mortgages. So I had to work. Mm. So I got a job as a delivery van driver. And I lasted one day. Uh -oh. And it's not funny because at the end of that day, I got home and I said, I'm seeing dots in my eye. And there was a veil over my eye, like I was wearing sunglasses just on one mm. eye. So I rang up the non-emergency number and they said, you need to get to the hospital straight away. So I went to the hospital that night and they did, I think it was four sessions of emergency eye surgery to stop my retina wow. from becoming detached. And as it turned out, I'd lifted something onto this van and held my breath at the first time at the same time so so don't ever when you're lifting something don't hold your breath breathe normally or breathe in or breathe out because it can it ripped a horseshoe tear in the thing that holds on your retina if it had gone all the way around i would have lost it and i wouldn't be able to see out of this eye as it is i've i've had surgery but the thing is so then the next morning I'm now, because the day before I'm in a position, okay, I can't get a radio job. It's locked down. No one wants to know. The next morning it's now, well, you're not allowed to drive and you're not allowed to lift anything heavy either. And it's locked down. So I suddenly had to work out how to earn a living from home. Mm. And so I went on the internet and I found audiobooks and I started recording audiobooks. And now, three years later, I've done 175 of them, including the case of the plucked chicken. And on Saturday night, this Saturday coming, I'm going to a black tie event in London at a hotel in London in Greenwich. My mm. wife and I have been invited and I've been nominated for best narration for one of the books I've done. And I'm down to the final seven in the UK to get this award. So it's all because if I hadn't, if I hadn't ripped this I think I'd God, be driving uh, a van now and I'd be broke. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the well, way it all worked out. And I would never have recorded the plucked chicken or gone with the wind and would never have met you. <laughs> well, I, I can't. I mean, I'm glad you're having a good time. And I'm having a great time. You, you're doing it so well. And uh, I, I mean, I, it's. That's uh, all I can say, Graham. Thanks for sticking I, to it. Thanks for I cannot, to it. I cannot see me ever going back to radio. I have so much fun mm. because the variety of the work, all sorts of things, but particularly your two books are just lovely. So much fun to perform. The characters, some of them really larger than life. You know, like the sheriff was just so good to do, you know, in this one. Where, do, where did the idea for the the case of the plucked chicken come from it's kind of complicated um when i started writing i was forced into it by my family when i started writing i didn't know what wait to write. wait wait stop there stop there you were forced into it by your family what they said like you're so good at stories you got to write these down is that what it was you got no she, this the, you know i've made up stories on the spot all the time i was in the coast guard and my children loved me you know, they love listening about my day because we had fascinating days. I'll I mean, bet. you can't, fascinating. And I was in the command center and s rescues of all kinds all over the planet. And, but sometimes there was no happy ending. So instead of me telling them about those, I just made up things on the spot. <laughs> Whatever came up. And then nice. one day I, I did that uh, for the fraudulent pumpkin. And they said, and I just sat there and I made up the story. And I said, and they said, Daddy, you got to write that one down. And they stayed on me. And my wife stayed on me. So when I finally sat down to do it, I'm like, well, what am I going to write? I couldn't even remember the story. I had to ask them. <laughs> uh. But while I'm trying to figure out what to write, I, you know, I said, you know what? <sighs> this is hard. It's very hard. You know, you got a blank page, you got to make up ideas. 
And then I said, well, you know what? Um, let's try this one. I made up titles, the case of the plucked chicken. Then I made up the third title. I said, the fart who came to dinner. It's not about <laughs> farting. And I made up the fourth title, Gone with the Wind. And I made up the fifth title and the sixth and the seventh. And then I backed into those stories based on the title. I said, you know what? If I saw that title, I'd want to read it. Yeah. So I decided to make stories that I wanted to write. And I decided to make them as, as, as dense as possible so that they're not truly a kid's kid's story that they could benefit anyone who read them. And they all had to have a nexus of a lesson in life. In this yeah. case, courage. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a lovely, lovely book. And it's, where did you get the artwork done? Because I think the art, cause when I, when I narrate, your books i get like very vivid pictures of what's going on and it's bright and it's colorful and it is just like the artwork who does the artwork how did you get that done because it fits gary, perfectly actually a gentleman from canada this time um yeah. gary wine from canada yeah um he did i mean he has a wonderful artistic signature as you have stated yeah but i'll tell you i i, I tell you what else what makes this book a little different when it comes to the artwork. I used artists from around the globe to give me ideas. Yeah. They read the book. They sent me anything that they wanted to. Um, they drew anything they wanted to draw. And I said, okay, fine. And I gave it all to Gary and used Gary's artistic, artistic signature to bring it to life. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's nice. It is It is really good. It's a, the whole the whole package is good too. And what about the characters? I mentioned the sheriff. Where did the characters come from? Are they people you know or exaggerations <laughs> of people you know? Um, believe it or not, Violet, who was the lead in, um, in Gone with the Wind, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. She's in there because I, I worked with someone named Violet who was who was determined and in, in so much that she intimidated people. Yes, <laughs> and. Right. And of course, there's who else is there? Mrs. Far oh, Mrs. Farley. Yeah, there's a guy I work with a guy I work with. I was going to go to lunch with him one time. Right. And then he said, you know what? My wife made me lunch today. So, you know, and I said, well, OK, well, if your wife made you lunch, you know, we can do it a different time. Rain check. He says, no, 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 no. She says, he said, everything she cooks tastes like liver. And I said, oh, got to use that one. <laughs> got to use that one. Yeah. Everything she cooks tastes like liver. So that's where <laughs> Mrs. Farley came from. So that's and in there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and those are the main three. And Well, not main three, but, you know, it's uh, the sheriff, who could have been John Wayne or anyone. Yeah, there's there's but 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 Graham does him better than John Wayne. ever. <laughs> well, thank you, Rodney. Thank you, Rodney. How was the process this time for doing this audio, turning your work into an audio book this time? A lot easier. It's a lot. Oh, was it book. was easier than last? Oh, shorter book. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Shorter book. But also um, it was I did a little edit, had someone to help me with it. Yeah. and cleaned up a lot so and it actually i think this is a natural story i mean i brought it down to its natural length and discarded some things but your process was easy i actually um did the wrong thing i think and took auditions i'll never do that again graham <laughs> i'll never do that again why no, be... what no, well, you got you. You've got to see what's out there. You got to see whether something else will suit it, or you know that's okay. It's fine. That's how it I works. Know. Yeah. I know. I know. There's there's varying differences. There's there's yeah. there's just so many different. I mean, it began to the time element to go through the auditions, and I, I you know, you've got to ooh got way more auditions 
a lot faster this time. Oh yeah, there's a lot more. I think there's a lot more narrators uh, out there now. Um, yes. Since lockdown, probably, or just because of the success of audiobooks. Audiobooks are becoming more and more. It's the fastest growing segment in publishing is audiobooks. So I think a lot of people, um, a lot of narrators and voiceover people, a lot of actors, and uh, but also I think a lot of people who just think they'll be good at it and perhaps they're not quite good enough yet. I don't know. Um, I, think, I think, yeah, there's a lot more people pitching for... Um, to, yes. to, to get jobs um, I actually think there are actually more books to audition for as well I think the whole thing is growing let me go back to if I could back to sure. how, how the story and the concept came about the yes the please kids. Yeah. have you ever looked around and saw I don't know how it is over where you are in London but um, there's a lot of chicken on a lot of tables and a lot of refrigerators around here and a lot of restaurants you look yeah. up and there's chicken everywhere what's for dinner it's chicken this what's for lunch chicken that what's yeah. for what's for the snack i don't know some kind of chicken i didn't realize how much chicken i got food poisoning from and chicken? i think it i we think it was because of chicken and there was a time after that that I didn't want anything to do with chicken. You know, if I heard chicken, what do you want? Nope. What are you guys eating? Chicken. Well, count me out. <laughs> I'll suck my thumb. I am not eating any chicken. So for a, quite a while, I didn't eat chicken. Um, understandably so. Yeah. So I didn't really make that connection between the story in my experience but later i realized that's probably where it came from it's deep inside yeah you're working it out you, you're working the chicken phobia <laughs> um, or what's the word in the book there's a great word in the book what is well, it rooster yeah. runner phobia is one and then yes. chicknesia oh wait a minute <laughs> yeah yeah also chickalunacy 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 yeah great did you make those words up I sh you know, that's I'm crazy that way. <laughs> yes, I did. That I'm, is so I'm good. In. That is because a, a child psychologist once told me his uh -oh. name was Dr. Pe no, he, I was not the child. I was <laughs> I was at I was actually at a uh, at a radio convention in funnily enough, New Orleans. And I forget where he's from. Somewhere in the South, his name's Dr. Perry Buffington. He goes by the name of Dr. Buff, and he was like a a radio psychologist, a bit like Fraser Crane, I think. Mm. And um, he he said that when they, back in the days of VHS, when they looked at the tape of Mary Poppins, they mm -hmm. could tell from the tape which was the most played bit of the movie. Mm. And the most played bit of the movie was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Absolutely. Because they worked out the kids wanted to learn how to say it and would keep rewinding it and playing it until they got it. Did you do that? I, well, we practiced. <laughs> because, because kids are wired for learning. So if you're doing a kid's book and you put something in there like chickalunacy, something brand new, a new word for kids to learn, you've got gold, Rodney. And I'll I got take. that, got that from a child psychologist. <laughs> Dr. Buff. <laughs> Dr. Buff, Dr. Perry Buffington. I don't know if he's still on the radio. This must have been about 15 years ago. I don't know if he, mm. if he's still on the radio. And he's, I bet he's still a practicing child psychologist because that was his business. And, the children uh, are wired for learning, though. I agree with that. I've seen yeah. it. And yeah. with this one, believe it or not, my children helped me work some of that stuff out. Did that. I'll tell you, I'll, 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 I wrote in the basement of our home and then I would come up and when I got new ideas, I mean, it was a nice basement, if you will, you know, but I wrote in the basement of our home because I needed that time away from everyone. Um, so when I would come up with an idea and I wanted to test it, I would go upstairs and I'd call everyone down 
and I would talk to them about it. And let me tell you, with this story, I knew I had something because no matter what I said, they said yes to. And number two, whatever I said, they would riff on it and laugh and they would continue on for quite a while. And finally I realized I thought I would be upstairs for 10 minutes. I was upstairs for 30 minutes and they're still talking about what we started with. And I said, you guys, you continue. I got to go right. So my (laughs) children and my wife, they, they actually laughed and laughed and laughed. And that's how I knew I kind of had something. So you kind of just got the, what, the basic scaffolding of the idea, then gave it to them and they kind of told you where to go next with it? I did it. I tested the words out on them. All right. So this is proper focus group research. You're actually testing it on the audience that it's written for. Absolutely. And they are, my children and my wife are credited in the print book. (laughs) <laughs> and so they should be if they were right. such a big part of the process rodney they should be Absolutely. yeah so who would you say is the book is for is it for is it for just is it for anybody is it specifically for kids because for as a, as yeah as a grown-up i really enjoyed it you know i was quoting bits of it to my wife julie which i I tend to do at the end of the day any day anyway when she says, how was your day today? And, and I said, oh, I was doing the case of the plucked chicken. She said, I said, remember that Gone with the Wind one? I said, she said, oh, yeah. I said, well, in this, <laughs> and away I go. <laughs> so I wouldn't be doing that if I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's gotten, believe it or not, I've not gotten a bad review. Great. Great. I've not gotten a bad review. And my uncle, and my, my uncle must be 70 years old. 72 mm-hmm. years old i was planning for him and my aunt and it was so funny it was so funny um graham right after i got the last one from you because i played the first 15 minutes and then i went back and played the entire thing and wow. my uncle and my aunt were getting into this discussion you know they you know they've been in a relationship for 300 years so they talk like that and then my uncle said you know what here's what happened when the pump concluded And he said that, and they're into it. And I said, (laughs) you know what? I started laughing. I started laughing. I started laughing because I said, you know what? That was funny how he said that. But he said it so strongly and so earnestly that it just got to me. Then I realized, wait a minute, I wrote that. (laughs) And then they were like, what's so funny? And I said, that's funny to me. And I wrote that a million years ago. So they got into it. I know it's my aunt and my uncle, but believe you me, they would be honest. Yeah. Oh, they're, they'd be a tougher crowd than, uh, than someone who was, uh, who was not, uh, had any family connection. They would be tougher to impress. I would have thought, cause they know you too. Oh, they know. Yeah. They, 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 they were into it. Yeah. They were like, where's the rest of the book? Where's the rest of the book? They called me over finish it we need to finish this story you know the first 15 minutes no we need to see how this ends brilliant it's great it's that's how the... you know that's how you know you did a great job Where's the that's how you know you did a great job my friend it's always in the writing i just have fun with it i just act it out the stuff is it's in the writing that's where the goods are really are i'm just putting uh a little bit of a, a sprinkle of something different on the top of it, but yours is the whole foundation and the building and the roof. I'm just putting a little bit of frosting on the roof, really, of this thing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's the case of the plucked chicken. If you'd like to get it, check the... If you're watching this on YouTube, then go to the description, and there are links there to Amazon, so you can uh, download the book, and it will sort you out. Where can we find out more about you, Rodney? Have you got a, a, a place on the web or the internet where people can find out more? Because they might be interested in Gone with the Wind as well or some of the other books. They might want the print versions of the books too. Where can they find you? Well, they can get them through Amazon and they will be able to get them th- through my website at My Magic Pumpkin. That should, it's, it's live now, but it's not complete. But it's MyMagicPumpkin.com. Okay. MyMagicPumpkin.com. Also, yes. look for Rodney Evans if you put Rodney Evans in this little search there on Amazon. So you get the, the details there. What is next for Rodney Evans? Well, I think there are two things. Number one, I have to do book three with you, Graham. 
Okay. So we've got. Game. So we've got. Instead of going from two to four, we can put the one in the middle, the join up put one. The one in the middle. <laughs> right. Right. And I've got to um, book number five. It's almost pretty much done to some degree, um, but I'm taking this time now to complete the the middle part of the series. You right. know, doing what I'm doing here with on uh, the audio books. So yeah. the case of the plucked chicken, and then is the fart who came to dinner, got to get that audio book. And then is book five to complete, which is called The Curse of the Downwind. Okay, okay. Well, I can't wait. I can't wait to read them because they are lovely. You'll enjoy them too. Your kids will howl. These are... There's a lot of fun in these books. There's there's comedy, but as you say, there's also an important moral in them too, about you know good stuff. And you know if you're a parent and you're worried about the content and the stuff your kids are getting into, you can't lose with this stuff. It's lovely. This one is the case of the plucked chicken. It's always good to you, Rodney. Good to talk to you, Rodney. And thank you so much for still for going down to the library to make sure that this still happened, even though. You're facing the dilemma of the great termite infestation, which could be the title of another book. <laughs> yes, it could be. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, let's just say you want to hope that there's not four or five of them as well. You just, yeah, this is just the only episode that you're going to get. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. It's the case of the plucked chicken. Get it now in the downloads. Go, in, go into the info on in YouTube and get it now. And uh, you really will enjoy it. You won't regret it. It's terrific. Rodney Evans, thank you so much. Thank you, Graham.